After further, further medical training at Duke, he returned to the faculty position at the Genetics Institute at Baylor College. Among his accomplishments was the realization of how the, to diagnose uh, gene defects in single cells. And that led to a collaboration with uh, Dr. Handyside at uh, UC London and Hammersmith, uh, which is one of the cradles of uh, PGD, where they uh, really produced the first PGD baby uh, for gene, uh, single gene defects. Uh, Professor Hughes has, um, was then recruited by the Human Genome Institute at the NIH. Um, plus then, um, he was named a chair of human genetics at Georgetown University. Uh, unfortunately, the, the NIH at the time was not very supportive of uh, embryo research, still is not very supportive of uh, embryo research. Uh, so he left and uh, became the director of uh, molecular medicine and genetics at um, Wayne State University, focused on PGD and stem cell research. Uh, there he received in 2001 uh, the Pioneer in Stem Cell Biology Award. Uh, his main clinical and scientific goals has been to uh, prevent inherited birth defects in children uh, using PGD. Uh, therefore, in uh, 2007, uh, because of what I said, the, the lack of funding in uh, embryo, um, embryonic research, uh, he founded uh, his institute, uh, Genesis Genetics, uh, which is uh, one of the, the main um, commercial labs uh, that do PGD in the US and probably he has one of the largest experiences in, in PGD uh, for uh, gene defects. Um, as you will see, he's also an excellent uh, communicator, uh, as well as a great scientist divulgator, uh, with programs in uh, BBC, Good Morning America, Today Show, CBS, Evening News, 60 Minutes, 2020, and Discovery Channel. He will now present his talk entitled Clinical Applications of PGD and PGS. Thanks, Santi. And uh, I want to thank the uh, um, uh, organizers uh, for inviting me to, to come over to New York. It's always fun to come to New York, uh, particularly in the autumn. Autumn in New York is wonderful. Um, so my talk is more aimed uh, at, uh, at patients. Uh, it's not so technical. Um, I believe um, most of the people that are probably watching this on stream uh, are patients. And so I'm not going to be showing lots of tables and lots of technology, although I am going to show you a little bit, uh, but my goal is to just sort of talk a little bit uh, about um, what, what the technology has been doing and where I think the field is going. And then the most exciting sums of the talks are coming a little bit later after me where um, Dagan Wells and others are going to be talking about uh, uh, the, the newest technology. So I'm not including those in my presentation so we won't have any overlap. I love this slide. I'm going to let you guess what it is for a minute. Um, basically, uh, this is uh, 26,000 employees at Genentech uh, uh, um, just this last February of this year, in which they had t-shirts and uh, balloons, and they stood out in front of the Genentech um, building in California and celebrated the 60th anniversary of Watson Crick DNA. Now, I don't know about uh, your families and your laboratories, but this must have taken an incredible amount of organization <laughs> to put this together. Now, every so often in there, if you could actually look at it real close, you're going to find an employee that's probably a little bit um, unusual. And so we could call them polymorphisms, or we could call them mutations. And they happen to be in there uh, not behaving themselves. And of course, most of our patients uh, out there don't really think about genetics very much. They surely don't think about genes often, except for maybe Gloria Vanderbilt or Calvin Klein genes until it comes time to have a family and then all of a sudden genetics is kind of important. And uh, so I like this slide as well because this is an example of how typical patients think about genetics where dad's genes go one way, mom's genes go the other and together somehow uh, they all mesh together to uh, make the child. Unfortunately though we know that uh, for those of us who are in this field of, of uh, reproductive medicine everything doesn't work so well. There's a marvelous symphony of life but unfortunately, there's this incredible genetic cacophony of starting it. And uh, we heard uh, quite a bit about that this morning, especially at the end here in, uh, in Dr. Griffo's talk. So the question is, how do you find what causes the cacophony and try to avoid it altogether or fix it in some manner? 
So for years, including the last issue of Life magazine, where they put uh, what we're talking about today on the cover effectively, you have a baby holding its family tree asking questions about did I inherit diabetes or cancer or Alzheimer's or my mother's smile or um, my father's eyes. And we are at that point today where we can actually do these kinds of tests um, and we can do it at the embryonic stage as we've been hearing this morning after doing biopsies of embryos. So there's two real reasons. This isn't 2103. This is supposed to be 2013. I have a little dyslexia. Um, uh, there's really two reasons why PGD is used. All morning long, everybody's been talking about chromosome analysis. I'm going to spend a couple minutes on that at the end, but you've heard quite a bit about that already. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about genetic inherited disorders. And this really came out of the early thinking of the groups at, at Cornell and in, and in Chicago and uh, at the Hammersmith in London where the early days of, of PGD were not so much about chromosomes as they were about avoiding an inherited genetic disease. So we heard about the trials and tribulations uh, that Dr. Griffo just talked about with regards to having a fertility problem, but there's another whole group of people out there who are at high genetic risk. Um, they know this because historically they have already had a child. They're not infertile. They have a child already that has an inherited genetic disease like cystic fibrosis or muscular dystrophy or hemophilia or one of hundreds of different inherited conditions. It's been in their family for generations. The good Lord gave us two copies of every gene, one from mom and one from dad. And uh, so they always have a backup copy and they have no idea that they carry this thing. And then out of the blue, this disease pops up in, in a child that they have or they have a relative in the family who has this condition and that alerts them. Now what's happening more and more is that people are being screened prior to even getting married and certainly prior to getting pregnant. Now the Jewish paradigm for this has been going on for a long time uh, and the rest of the world is uh, finally caught up with this. And so there's companies out there, Recombine and others, who will actually screen you before uh, you actually consider having a family so that you have your little index card of the genetic disorders that you happen to carry. And trust me, we all carry genetic diseases. We just are blissfully unaware of what they are until they unfortunately pop up and give us a child with the disease. One of the things that's happening, though, is that traditional screening has been done when you sit down with a genetic counselor who says, well, what's your ethnic background? But today, if you ask a typical 20-year-old, what's your ethnic background, they'll shake their head and look at you like, what are you talking about? Oh, I'm 164th uh, Irish and 116th French or whatever, or they don't even know. And in fact, in America, most of us are mutts. And so we really don't know, and so we really can't go backwards anymore with high reliability and say that I carry this particular condition because I happen to be of Northern European ancestry or I carry thalassemia because I happen to be of Mediterranean origin, or I carry um, Tay-Sachs because I happen to be Jewish. In fact, the last two patients that we've taken care of, unrelated entirely, that had Tay-Sachs disease happened to be black couples. Uh, and they had absolutely no idea that they had uh, a Jewish founder mutation and that they had Jewish ancestry uh, sometime back in their history. So, Genetic screening, which you're going to hear about in a little while from Alex, is, is, is an example of where now we're finding out or we're becoming aware of the disorders that we carry. Now, what does a couple do when they find this out? Well, if you've had a child with a genetic disease already, you're dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. You know this disease better than any doctors. You live with it every day. And so if you're thinking about having additional children, you're afraid. And so most of these families elect not to have any kids or any more. In fact, they'll tell you, even though it's incorrect in a way, they'll tell you that it goes to the core of who they are as individuals. They'll tell you that they feel like they did this to their child, even though we all know that that's not true. We all carry these genes. And they'll tell you that it goes to the core of their marriage. And, it, and, it's, and they stop or de markedly decrease being intimate because they realize that they're walking down a road in which the likelihood is that they could have a bad outcome. And so it takes all the fun out of getting pregnant at home. 
So these aren't the infertile ones now we're talking about. These are people who are perfectly capable of getting pregnant and they go to IVF centers to avoid a disease, um, which is a different stressful level altogether. And most of these families are just too afraid and they don't have any more. Some of them will go out and adopt and we have wonderful programs now to help people adopt. I think we need to get a few less people involved in this process so it's not so expensive, but I'll get off my high horse on that. People will use artificial insemination with the sperm of an anonymous donor, for example. Or you could use egg donation as well. It's just a little more expensive. So you test that individual and find out for sure that that person doesn't carry the gene that you happen to have in the family. And then you know that your embryo and therefore your child uh, won't have the disease. Worst case scenario would be a carrier of the condition. Now why most people select that top option, the next most select the bottom, and they go out and throw the dice again. They know they've got a three out of four chance of everything going well, so they hope for the best, and then they consider whether they want to have a prenatal test like a CVS or amniocentesis into their pregnancy. Now, I don't care how you feel about pregnancy termination, whether it should never be done and be outlawed, or whether it's a woman right to choose, and that's the end of the discussion. No one wants to walk down that road, that one-way road, from the beginning. You don't want to even think about getting pregnant if you know that you have a very high likelihood that that might be an outcome. And that's where PGD came from now 20 years ago. In those early days, the best we could do is sex select to avoid disorders that affected only boys by transferring female embryos. And then in the early days, cystic fibrosis, the gene was cloned in 1989. And by 1990, groups were doing PGD for cystic fibrosis. Boy, a lot has happened in 20 years. Now you can test for thousands of different inherited diseases, and the reference laboratories that do this all have lists like this. Most doctors have never seen some of these disorders because they're so rare. 17,000 plus, we actually don't have a worldwide registry to know for sure, but thousands and thousands of all sorts of genetic disorders um, have been born now avoiding these diseases. Alpha thalassemia, for example, is so prevalent in Southeast Asia that we opened a laboratory there. If you have this happening to your pregnancies over and over, you're looking for an alternative, then your physician patting you on the back and saying, go home and try again. Eventually the dice chromosome, uh, the gene dice will come up the right way. So we put a lab over in Taipei. We're doing hundreds of cases of this technology to avoid this disease in a, in a, in a population where this is rampant. And of course, you can do this for all sorts of disorders, and I'm just picking out a few here. Here's Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This little boy already is toe walking, and he's got pseudohypertrophy of his calf muscles in his legs. Um, and um, used to be this was a pretty lethal condition. Science and medicine have improved just like it has for cystic fibrosis. It isn't as bad of a disease as it was 20 years ago with great science that's happened, but it's still a pretty devastating condition. Laboratories that do this kind of work have been criticized because what's the difference between an inherited disease that's terrible and one that's not so bad and one that's a trait? Surely most of us in medicine wouldn't be, believe it would be a good idea to be testing for whether a single change in your DNA that causes your earlobe to be hanging or attached to your head is a disease. So it would be foolish to be testing for those kinds of things. But what about skin diseases? When we first did this, and I think the Chicago group had the same criticisms by outside groups, they said, my goodness, why are you testing embryos for skin diseases? Well, this is epidermal lysis bullosa. This is one of many inherited skin diseases. This is brothers, and the one obviously has the disease. His parents love him very, very much. I don't know if you can see on the picture, but he can't use his hands, and he can't walk either. Um, and this family says, we just don't want this to happen again. We'd like to have additional children. We have a one out of four chance of a recurrence. We want to avoid it. In Fragile X syndrome, of course, Fragile X is the most common cause of inherited mental retardation. All sorts of women are carrying this in one of their two X chromosomes and they have no idea and it's been in their families for generations and suddenly they have a boy with the disease because the gene is dynamically changing from one generation to the next until finally it manifests in a pretty severe inherited condition. The groups that do PGD have done hundreds and hundreds of cases helping couples avoid a disorder like Fragile X syndrome. Then of course we have Huntington disease. 
And uh, uh, um, Dr. Simpson mentioned in one of the early talks about this, so I thought I would just take a moment and take off from this. Huntington disease is an interesting condition. It's rather unique almost in, in medical genetics. Um, and that's because, first of all, you don't generally get the symptom. You have the gene at birth, but you generally don't get the symptoms until you're in your late 30s or early 40s. And by then, you've already had your children and passed the gene on with a 50-50 chance to the next generation. So this is a dominantly inherited disease. If you've got it, your egg will have a 50-50 chance of having the mutation or your sperm well, and you can give it to your half of your children. And that's how the statistics work. So hundreds of patients. Uh, come and ask for PGD to avoid this condition. But Dr. Simpson mentioned another twist on this, which is called um, non-disclosure diagnosis. So suppose, for example, that I was in my 20s and that uh, my mother, we'll say, uh, has Huntington disease, and she now has the symptoms of this dreadful condition. And I know that I have a 50-50 chance of having inherited it and I could send a little cheek swab sample over to a commercial laboratory and for virtually nothing they can test me and tell me whether I got the gene from my mother or not. But if you do a survey of people in that setting, over 80% of them will tell you they don't want the test. Not because of the cost of the test, it's cheap, but because they don't want the information. I'm not sure I would want to know either. Do I want a crystal ball about my future? Do I want to lie to my employer because I know this is coming down the road and I'll never give it, be given a job of responsibility if my employer recognizes that I will have symptoms of this in my late 30s? So most people say, don't test me. So let's suppose now my wife and I would like to have children and I'm worried that I might have it and give it to my kids and I'd like to remove it from my family tree forever, prune it right out of the tree, so what do I do? Well, we can't get pregnant on our own at home the fun way and go and have a prenatal test like an amniocentesis because if you find that the mutation is in our fetus, I'll know by default I carry the gene from my mom and I don't want to know. So I would like non-disclosure. I'd like to be guaranteed my child will be healthy, but I don't want to know. And so what the couple does is they go to the in vitro fertilization clinic they make some embryos. The embryos are biopsied and tested. Embryos that don't have the disordered are transferred to the uterus. The couple begins their pregnancy on day one knowing the disease isn't there. And I'm never told whether any of the embryos had the disease or not. A non-disclosing diagnosis to me. Is that ethical? Well, maybe so, but what happens if we go through IVF and we don't get pregnant the first time? And now we need to do another cycle. But the laboratory knows that I don't carry the gene. Well, as the physician, I would love to pat them on the back and wink and say, go home and have kids the fun way. You don't need all this technology. But I can't do that because if they thought for a second that that's what I would do in that setting when they started their IVF and I didn't do it, they'd know why. Plus, just like you are watching on a stream at home, uh, people are chatting. And so people in... Tulsa and T T T Tacoma, Washington and Tallahassee are all talking to one another. And I can't tell a couple in one city to go home and have kids because you don't carry the gene and not tell one another because they will make the inference. So the technology, as always in medicine, is this incredible engine that drives science. And science is this machine that pushes medicine. And sometimes, often, it pushes us into bioethical corners about what are we going to do now with this newfound ability? And how do we best use it to take care of our patients? Few would argue that a disorder like X-linked hydrocephalus is a severe condition. Um, and avoiding that is a good idea. But look at all these different genetic disorders. You probably have never heard of them all. Lots and lots of them. How about an adult disease like polycystic kidney disease? How about that? So this is where you get this gene, you inherit it in a dominant way, 50-50 chance, or it's a new mutation. And you go through life until you're probably in your 40s or something and you start getting hypertension, you get high blood pressure and your doctor recognizes there's issue and starts trying to figure out what it is and finally realizes that you have polycystic kidney disease. Well, there's a treatment for this, hemodialysis. 
and eventually, if you're lucky, a kidney transplant. So the question becomes, should we be testing embryos to avoid a disease that comes out later in life and that actually has a treatment? Not a great treatment, but a treatment. And where do we draw these lines? As I alluded to earlier, when we did those first cases of cystic fibrosis, it was a terrible disorder in which children barely live through their teens. Now, people with cystic fibrosis are coming to IVF clinics in order to have a family. They live long enough to have families, and their, um, the modern medicine and pulmonology has done wonders for them. That's what should happen. So a bad, bad disease is still not a great disease, but it isn't the same. And the point I'm trying to make is that there's a gigantic gray zone about what's bad and what's a trait and where the zones are in between and who decides. Should it be people sitting around a mahogany table in some capital that never saw this disease before? Probably not. Should it be the patient? They can have whatever they want. They come into the IVF clinic, well, I'd like to have this and this and this in my embryo and we become like, like um, cosmetic surgeons. Where do we draw lines? Or are there no lines? I would hope there are, but the question is, how do you draw them? And they evolve and they move. RH incompatibility is an example, and I won't talk too much about that. How about a single change in one letter in three and a half billion letters of your genome causing a clinical phenotype like this? No one would argue that's not a trait. And sickle cell disease, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a, in a moment. And if I could cure a disorder of any kind, it would be spinal muscular atrophy. About one in 29 or so of us, one in 30 of us, carry a mutation in this gene. And it doesn't matter where you're from. This isn't a disorder like sickle cell that affects blacks or Tay-Sachs that affects the Jewish population. This, there are several people in this room that carry this gene and don't have any idea that they do. And if they happen to marry somebody with the same gene, which is why genetic screening, with what you're going to hear about in a little while, is valuable. And most of these children, they're born, they look perfectly fine, they go home, everybody's smiling, and about six months of age or so, mom comes to the pediatrician and says, you know, I don't think we're keeping up with the books. The, the, I'm reading these baby books and we're not keeping up. And the physician pets her and says, go home, everything's fine, we all develop at different speeds, don't worry about it, your child looks great. And the next month, mom comes back again and she says, no, this isn't right. Not only aren't we keeping up, we could, my baby could do things, had milestones last month that, that he or she no longer has now. We're losing milestones. Pediatric neurologist is called, spinal muscular atrophy is diagnosed. Most of these kids are dead by two years of age, in fact, most of them by one. And there's nothing medicine can do for them at the moment. And if that is happening to you with a high hit rate, you're looking for an alternative than just trying again and having another baby after you bonded with one, brought it home, and then lost it. There's two different kinds of spinal muscular atrophy. This is spinal muscular atrophy type 2. We do quite a bit of this twisting too. This is a different change in the gene, which would take me too long to explain. Baby doesn't die, lives on, um, but has a difficult existence. This couple lives in Brazil. And they never came to the United States uh, to have this technology. Uh, they went to an IVF program there. They made some embryos. The embryos were biopsied, were sent on a plane to a reference laboratory, were tested. Next day, embryos were transferred and they have a child over there around the balloon. In fact, it almost looks like a fake doll to me. I mean, this is an amazingly beautiful child. Hundreds of children like this have been born to couples that have this kind of a risk. This is where you cannot argue the value of pre-implantation diagnosis technology. Well, what about cancer? Should we be testing our embryos for a risk for cancer? This is a retinoblastoma, it's a tumor of your retina, but um, it doesn't just cause tumors of the retina. This is one of these powerful tumor suppressor genes. It's like a thermostat in the house. It controls lots of other genes, lots of other rooms, lots of other cells. You get these cancer family syndromes. And a more common one is breast cancer, BRCA. And if you happen to carry the BRCA mutation, you have a 50% risk of giving it to your kids. 
And people who have watched this through their family and watched lots of 20 and 30 year olds and their family die of breast cancer are looking to remove it from their family tree. So should we use PGD to test for cancer? Well, lots of people have argued no, you shouldn't, because just because you have the mutation doesn't mean you'll get the disease. In genetics, we say genotype doesn't predict phenotype necessarily. So you have the mutation, but you may not get the disease. So should we be testing for something that never might happen? Well, there's lots of different ones. BRCA is a good example of this. And I wanted to just mention something that we're doing quite a bit now of. We're combining with fertility preservation programs. So you take a patient who has um, breast cancer mutation or breast cancer. So this is an example. This woman's 31 years old and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was tested. She has a mutation in the BRCA1 gene. So she wants to have a family eventually, but she knows that her chemotherapy and radiation treatment are probably going to render her infertile. So she goes to the IVF clinic. She has her eggs collected and they vitrify those. Beautiful thing about vitrification is you can actually successfully freeze eggs. A few years ago, you couldn't. Technology is wonderful. We get better and better, as Griffo was saying. Okay, so she had 11 oocytes and they froze those. And now she goes to the, to the um, cancer center and she has her chemotherapy and her radiation treatment. 21 months later, they thaw four of those eggs. They fertilize those. We do pre-implantation testing for BRCA and we do pre-implantation testing for 24 chromosomes like you've been hearing this morning, and they go on and have a healthy daughter without this gene. Some months later, she wants to have another child. They thaw three of her eggs. She goes through the process and she doesn't get pregnant. So then they thawed the last remaining four. Nowadays, you'd thaw one at a time. This was just a few years ago. They thawed four. She went through the process and she had a healthy boy. So this is the woman with her two children. Neither of them carry the mutation. And now we've got 93 babies born. Actually, I think it's up to 116 now. Babies born with, by this technology with some ongoing pregnancies as well. Removing the gene, helping a couple have a family, especially after they would have been rendered infertile by their own treatment. Lots of different cancers have been successfully treated this way. These are some of the ones that you might have heard about breast cancer, colon cancer, leaf Romani syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia, retinoblastomas, etc. Now, in the early days of PGD some 20 years ago, when we were all sitting in our laboratories d using what we now would consider pretty archaic technologies, um, I remember vividly sitting in the Hammersmith Hospital with a jacket on because they had such a financial issues in the hospital that they weren't heating it very well. And, um, Handyside and I were arguing about the fact that these technologies are only going to be available to rich people. Who else is going to be able to afford these sorts of things? So that's been bothering me for years. So we've tried uh, to investigate whether we could move the technology elsewhere. So we went to this area of Africa where sickle cell mutation, a mutation, single nucleotide change, single letter in the DNA of the beta hemoglobin gene gives you, makes you a carrier for sickle cell anemia, and 26% of the population there carry this gene. So they're marrying each other, and they're having children where they both give the mutation. And now the child doesn't have a backup copy of the gene and has sickle cell. So what's interesting is that uh, across Africa, they actually have pretty good IVF. Most of them trained in, um, in uh, Europe, mostly in England, and then they went home. They've set up beautiful IVF programs there. They're state-of-the-art, some of them, are very impressive. And they can get people pregnant if they're infertile, um, but they don't know how to do the molecular biology. So we have a machine there, a, a modern real-time PCR machine. And the embryologist biopsies the embryos and puts them into the machine and turns, it, turns the machine on. They have to push the electric button, and we can run the machine from a distance and we can identify within four hours which of the embryos will not have sickle cell and they can do an embryo transfer. And we can do this for $36 a sample. And patients are incredibly happy about this. 
Now, Dr. Simpson mentioned also about uh, this HLA business, and I wanted to just mention that briefly. Why is this woman smiling? Well, she's smiling because she's got two healthy kids. But that boy was not so healthy. Uh, he has a lethal disorder called hyper-IgM syndrome. And what his mother and dad did was they went to an IVF clinic. They generated some embryos. We tested them for hyper-IgM mutation. And we also tested them for whether or not they were a perfect stem cell match, their HLA transplantation genes on chromosome 6, and identified which ones would not have the disease and be healthy, like a previous speaker mentioned and showed you the statistics. And they transferred that embryo and she has this healthy child whose cord blood now, loaded with stem cells, is simply given to the sibling. So imagine this. You're not only handing this couple a healthy baby, but you're saving the life of the child they have who's sick, all in one fell swoop. These are the kinds of things that we all dreamed about 20 years ago in PGD, and now the reference centers are doing this routinely with IVF programs all around the world. This little girl saved her brother's life. He still has a bit of a large liver there, but um, um, his um, inherited disorder, metabolic inherited disorder, uh, was cured by her cord blood. And this little boy is about to have a, a transplant. He has schwachmann diamond syndrome, and the new baby from IVF is, um, is healthy, and the cord blood from that sibling is going to save his life. So in 1992, as I said, we did cystic fibrosis and X-linked disorders. And then led by the folks in Chicago primarily and others, we added more and more and more genetic disorders. And so the take home message in 2013 is that really there's no technical limitations anymore. If the molecular basis of the disease is known, PGD can be done for it, except for disorders of genetic imprinting, which I'm not going to talk about, and mitochondrial disorders, mutations in mitochondria. Otherwise, it can be done. And with whole genome sequencing, which you're going to hear about a little bit later this afternoon, we now can find these disorders even more quickly. And we can test them that way in embryos, but we can also test them in individuals that way. So it's not a question anymore of can we. We can. The question is, should we? And where shouldn't we? And who decides? OK. So, no one had talked about inherited disorder PGD, so that's why I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about that. And in the last few minutes of my talk, because I don't want to overburden PGS because the real leaders of the field are in the room, I wanted to just mention that, of course, the technology is obviously being used widely now to improve the rates of assisted reproduction. This is a slide uh, courtesy of uh, Richard Scott, in which it shows when you start out with a certain number of uh, mature follicles, you end up with uh, very few babies. And these are high quality IVF programs. So everyone has this problem. And as Dr. Griffo mentioned uh, quite eloquently, the reason for this mostly is chromosomes, which is why PGS has had a rebirth. The way in which those chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate before they get pulled to their daughter cells with little tubular cables and how they all find one another, and how these big pages of gene paragraphs all collate to each other so that we don't have missing material and make it through is truly the miracle of life. But unfortunately, it goes wrong, as we heard already this morning, a lot. This is a statistic that will blow your mind and why animal studies don't always work. The incidence of a chromosome aneuploidy, the wrong number of chromosomes, after the first meiotic division, so early on now, when the egg and sperms are being made, is nearly 100,000 times higher in a human than in a mouse. How do you make an animal model in a mouse when you've got a 100,000 time different process going on? Now, part of the reason for this is we're not having our children when we're 16 anymore. That's a good thing. But that's not all of it. There's a lot more to it than that, and we don't even begin to know what it is. 
But we do know, of course, that it continues to get worse as the pictures uh, that Griffo showed about how, what happens by the time you're 40. So the action's all in chromosomes. And if you put the data together with the big major reference labs around the world, Genesis and Reaper Genetics and RMA Genetics and the Belgian group, um, uh, this is what you find. If you find that the age um, uh, uh, years at embryo transfer down across the bottom and aneuploidy goes up and everybody's seeing the same thing. So everybody's moved to these things called microarrays. You heard about that a little bit this morning. I want to take a moment and explain to you what this is. Not because you really have to know the details, but because it's really kind of, you just don't throw out numbers like idiopathic. <laughs> Let's talk, let, let me explain to you what this is. Okay, so we now have all of the letters of the genome. And, um, and we can play with these little pieces of DNA. They can be little teeny tiny pieces of DNA about 15 letters long which we call an oligonucleotide. So there's about 15 or so letters in it, perhaps. Or they can be larger pieces of DNA. And they're all, I wish I had a pointer, they're all lined up along each of our chromosomes. So some of them that you might, for certain kind of arrays, you might have a piece that's 350 to 500 little letters long. And for others, you might have these little oligonucleotides that have a little tiny polymorphism, a little tiny change in the DNA in the middle. And that's what you're trying to interrogate on the chromosomes. So now what happens is you take these little pieces of DNA that are commercially available even, and you take them down the chromosome and you spot them down onto a microarray, onto a little spot. So there's these robots that just print these for us. And you actually print them in more than one place. So you take that little piece of DNA out there at the end of the chromosome and you put it on three, four places. So you have multiple different places that should give you the same answer. It creates a higher quality control. And you do this all the way along. And then you take the DNA from the embryo and from a normal and you put them together and you get these things that are called microarrays. In which you get green, yellow, and red spots depending on whether there's too little, a monosomy, or too much, a trisomy. And the computers can simply read this for us and create a picture that looks like this. Now, you can actually, as a patient, you can understand this picture. Across the bottom, in those tiny little numbers, are the chromosomes. So over on the left is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it runs along all the way across the bottom of the, of the slide. And, and if you look carefully, there's going to be a, there's a green line that runs across, and then below that, a red line. Are they coming up? Yeah, a green and a red line. And in between are thousands and thousands of signals from the microarray in the region of chromosome 1 and in the region of chromosome 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way along. And what you want is yellow. You want the green and the red to come together and give you a yellow spot. And, it, and that will be right between the green and the red on the plot, on the graph. So all of those spots are lining up right in the middle, all the way along until, uh-oh, what's that going on way over on the right? It pops up. A whole bunch of spots. There's too many of them. And then it goes way down and there's too few. Well, that's two X's and no Y. So this is an example of a microarray of a perfectly normal embryo that's female, two X's and no Y's. And this is what a normal male one looks like. There's one X, so it comes down to the middle, and there's one Y, so it comes back up to the, to the top. OK, so now let's take what we heard this morning, from, particularly from Dr. Cohn, and let's sort of put it together, because he, he was talking about this, but I want to take the same idea now and connect it to microarrays. So here's a typical IVF cycle, and here's a patient, a real patient, and here's her six, their six embryos. Now, if an embryo stopped growing, okay, and really looks terrible, it's going to have poor chromosomes, so there's not much point in spending the resources to even look at it. But trying to anticipate the other direction, as Jacques was explaining, is more, much more difficult. So you look at these embryos, which one is, the, is your doctor going to put back? Well, you don't know. So as Griffo said, you put back more than one, right? But we don't want to do that. We want to put back one. And we want the one that's most likely to get you pregnant, 
assuming of course it's transferred correctly and assuming that the uterus is right and assuming that all the other confounding variables are correct. But which one are you going to put back? Well, let's just take a look at the chromosomes on a microarray from those six embryos. So embryo number one, you know from previous, that's a perfectly normal embryo. All the little spots are between the red and the green line. And it has one X and one Y, so that's a normal male embryo. Embryo two looks pretty decent, but uh-oh, look at there out by chromosome 16. It has only one chromosome 16, not two like it's supposed to. That is not compatible with life. You would not want to transfer that embryo. And if your clinic just put it back and you don't get pregnant, you're blaming the clinic. Why can't they get me pregnant? They said I made a beautiful embryo. Look at how beautiful it is. Why can't I get pregnant? They must, they're terrible clinic. I'm going to go to an, I'm going to go somebody, somebody down the street. And you go clinic shopping. Trisomy 16 isn't going to make a baby. You would not have been able to tell it by looking at that under a microscope. Look at embryo three. It's chaotic. It looks like a tumor. That's not going to make a baby either for sure. Embryo four is perfectly fine. Two X's and no Y. That's a female embryo. Embryo five is beautiful too. And embryo six, oops, it has monosomy four. No baby in history has ever been born with monosomy four. You wouldn't want to transfer that embryo. These technologies have been used on over a million and a half prenatal samples around the world and over 200,000 embryos. And it has a positive predictive value of 99.1% and a negative predictive value of 99.4%. Not only that, the same data come out of other methods of technology. So we know that they work. So if you hear people saying the arrays don't work, they don't know what they're talking about. They work. So I want to give you one example. You heard this morning about a paper that came out of California where they were looking at good prognosis patients. Couples that were coming to the IVF clinic, they had a fertility problem, and, uh, and uh, they were in their mid-30s, and they wanted to see whether a microarray was going to help them. And indeed, the data show that it does. Well, so I took that part out of my talk, and I want to just show you an example of the older patients. And Griffo showed you a little bit of this as well. So let's take some women between the ages of 40 and 43. They're the poor prognosis patients in IVF, unfortunately. So in this study, we just took 50 patients in a row, all from the same clinic. They were women ages 40 to 43. In fact, 19 of the patients were 40, 14 of them were 41, 11 were 42, and 6 of them were 43 years old. They had a normal male workup. They didn't have any problems with sperm or they wouldn't have been enrolled. And they had conventional IVF, so they didn't have ICSI. They did array CGH on day three in this study. And as we heard this morning, it would be better to do it on day five. But they did it on day three. We're a reference center. We, do, we don't run the IVF clinic. We work with the IVF clinic. So when you work with lots of IVF clinics, to go back to what Jacques was saying this morning, the confounding variables become very difficult because each clinic does things differently. So for us to sort of meld all those data together and try to tell you that it means something when we can't control all of the aspects of what goes on before we get a sample, it's garbage in, garbage out like the old days in computers. So we don't try to talk about those data. But when we work with a given clinic, it's a different story. So of those 50 infertile couples, 31 of them received a single embryo transfer. Why did they get a single embryo transfer? Because they only had one embryo that was chromosomally normal on the microarray. Eight of them took two embryos. Nowadays, I think we would have said probably don't do that, and you'll see why in a minute, but eight of them received two embryos. And 11 of them didn't get any transfers at all because they didn't make any normal embryos. And the last thing you'd want to do is say, well, let's take a chance and put it back because the worst case scenario is I won't get pregnant or I'll get pregnant and lose the pregnancy soon thereafter. Well, if you're in your 40s and you're going to lose three, four, five months while you're waiting for that experiment, those are critical months for your pregnancy uh, potential. So it makes more sense to not transfer any. Now, these are amazing numbers. 22 of 39 delivered, uh, uh, delivered and they all had normal amniocentesis and now have delivered normal babies. That's 56% pregnancy rate in this old group. Sorry older group. 
Now, three of the patients of eight that had the two embryos transferred um, had normal twins. Three of the eight had twins. And four patients, four of six, who were 43 years old, 43 years old, delivered normal baby. Now, you can use the same technology if you're a translocation carrier. So let's suppose that you or your partner has um, a big chunk of chromosome number four, and it's been moved over to chromosome eight, or, okay, let's say eight. So we've translocated, we've moved a bunch of chapters in the encyclopedia of genes from chromosome four to chromosome eight. We've translocated thousands of genes, perhaps, from one chromosome to another, okay? In fact, you can even take them and turn them upside down and transfer them to the other chromosome. The cell doesn't care, it can read the genes, no problem, okay? But now, so you're perfectly healthy because you have all of the genes you're supposed to have. It just happened to be on the wrong chromosome. You're a balanced translocation carrier. You don't have any loss of material. But now when your chromosomes in your egg or sperm try to match up with your partners, the Xerox machine that's making copies of all these book of genes gets confused because this chromosome 4 is missing material that this chromosome 8 has and it doesn't line up right with your partner. And the collator starts throwing pages of genes out all over the floor and now you have missing and gains of genetic in material and now that embryo has an unbalanced translocation which is usually incompatible with life, hopefully, because if it's not, it creates severe birth defects. Very severe birth defects, usually. So here's an example of a woman. She has a translocation. If you look at the top of the, of, the, of the slide, she has one of her chromosomes, chromosome 14, has a chunk of information that got transferred over to chromosome 17 and vice versa. And here's two of her embryos. And one of them, incidentally, has monosomy 1, which is not compatible with life, but it's missing material, it's missing material on, uh, on chromosome 14 and it moved it over to chromosome 17. And on another embryo, it went the other direction. It went from 14 to 17 the other way. It's deleted on 17 and you wouldn't want to transfer either of those embryos. So the technology can be used for all sorts of things. Now, here's 81,000 embryos that have been analyzed um, using these technologies. And the only point I want you to get from this is this. We all learned in school, if we took biology classes, or we learned from our genetic counselor, that the chromosomes we really have to worry about are chromosomes 13, 16, 18, 21, X, and Y. The other ones you just don't see, those are the ones you have to worry about. And in fact, those are the ones you see in an amniocentesis or a chorion villus sampling during a pregnancy. Okay. So if you're testing at that stage, those are what you're really looking for. But if you're testing in the embryo, look at what you see. All of those ones that won't make babies are equally represented with the ones that will. So if, you, if you're not looking at all 24 chromosomes, you're really not going to get a decent picture of what's going on, which was one of the problems of fish earlier on. Fish, fish works, but because you couldn't look at all the chromosomes, and some of them, many of them, won't make a baby, it didn't give you the enormous impact of the technology that you can with a microarray. So, here we are, 20 years on, and the Albert Einstein lived nearby here, and uh, he said this, and is one of my favorite quotes of his, and we have to think about it all the time as we improve these technologies and cast out the ones that don't work so well, as we try to help our patients have healthy families. And that is our wisdom must always outpace our technology. Thank you very much.